all three readings, so they give or uh, refer to one salient, salient theme, that is God's forgiveness. God is portrayed clearly for what He is, a compassionate Father, a God who relents for as long as sinful man repents. The first reading from Exodus reminds me of a carabao, a Philippine water buffalo, used as a beast of burden that we had in seminary many years ago. The strong and self-willed carabao suffered from a torn nose right where the noose ought to have been, all for one reason. He hemmed and hawed and protested continuously against his masters. At some point, the nose tissue that tethered him to the ground gave way. A gaping open wound thus made it impossible to keep the animal on leash, making it impossible to further train him as a beast of burden to help us till the soil and plow the ground. He was literally a picture of that biblical metaphor of a stiff-necked people that the book of Exodus speaks of. Sadly, the seminary authorities had to dispose of the hapless beast not, not long after. It sounds so counterintuitive, but this is what the biblical good news is all about. Like the stiff-necked carabao, sinful Israel would have been easily given up by God as bad job. See how stiff-necked this people is? Let me alone then that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Sinful disobedience does have a price tag, and the wages of sin, we are told, is death. But thankfully, the story does not end in tragedy. The theme of sinfulness that juts out repeatedly in the whole of Scripture is more than amply balanced by the th theme of forgiveness. First, we see the figure of an intercessor, a mediator, Moses, who implored the Lord and begged him to reconsider by an act of remembrance. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self. We know the story all too well. The Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. Secondly, Paul, a self-confessed blasphemer and a persecutor, an arrogant man, was mercifully treated on account of Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. Paul was profuse with praise for this God, the King of Ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God. In this first and second instance, forgiveness comes to sinful men and women from God but a forgiveness mediated and channeled through Christ and the man who foreshadowed him, Moses. The Gospel takes the topic of divine forgiveness a notch higher and clinches the nature and extent of this forgiveness from a loving, merciful God. The parable of the prodigal father shows us what the one true mediator, Jesus Christ, has revealed his father to be, a compassionate, loving, and forgiving God who, despite the protestations of an older brother who sent some type of misplaced justice, declared, Now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Celebration. The readings seem to point to the not-so-obvious consequence of God's forgiveness. Why celebrate? The younger, sinful, but repentant son in the, in the parable offers us a clue. He said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And herein is the clincher. Our sins separate us from God, but it is the same God whom we have offended that draws us near to Him in His Son, Jesus Christ. Through no merit of our own save that of His Son, we have been deemed worthy of forgiveness. We celebrate the character of God, His loving kindness, His mercy, His unparalleled love for His wayward creatures. We celebrate the nature of Christ, His Son, whose grace has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He came into the world to save sinners. But celebration can only come after confession. 
Celebration can only happen after we realize just how far we have been from this loving, pursuing God. Referred to by the poet Francis Thompson as the Hound of Heaven, whom we try so hard to evade, elude, and escape from. But just like the proverbial hound, God in and through Christ continues to search for us, to go after us, and to be solicitous for our welfare. Celebration follows confession. Just look at how we do liturgy. We begin with the confiteor, the confessing of our sins at Mass. Only after that can we sing glory to God. Only after the acknowledgement of our sins can we sing the Alleluia and be ready to break the bread of God's Word and the bread of the Eucharist. St. Paul gives us a perfect example as he acknowledges, Of these, I am the foremost. The younger son could not have even dreamt of a party, but put up by his father until he sadly acknowledged before him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. There is little celebration in the world everywhere. There is little trust between and among peoples. There is precious little harmony and love. In their stead, we see a whole lot of violence, terrorism, wars, and everything that smacks of a culture of death. For many people, they take all this to mean that God does not care, that God is indifferent to what suffering humanity undergoes on a daily basis. People are prone to condemn God and to lose faith in Him and in His love. If God really loves us, they say, then how come He allows all these things to happen? Failures of men are attributed wrongly as failures of God. Today's readings take exception to such a worldview. Today's readings unmask human sinfulness for what it really is, a form of slavery that God takes pains to deliver us from. Today's liturgy takes us away from a culture of blame, a tendency to deflect responsibility onto others, including God. Instead, the readings lead us to claim and tame that which we so easily heap onto others outside of ourselves in the form of blame, our own sins. There is little celebration in the world for people who do not invest in confession. There is little love in the heart of one who does not open his heart enough to feel the onrush of God's forgiving love. He who is forgiven much loves much. He who is forgiven little loves little. And forgiveness begins with claiming one's sins as, one, as one's very own. The parables of the Lord that speak of losses and findings all end with a celebration, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son of today's gospel. Only those who acknowledge their loss in the first place are worthy of participating in the celebration. Only those who seek find. And only those who acknowledge that they are lost are found by God. Only those who repent can rejoice. For once they were dead, but we have come back to life again. Once they were lost and have been found. Losses, findings, and rejoicings. This is the story of God's love in three short chapters. Man's sinfulness, God's searching, mankind's repentance, and great rejoicing in heaven. Have you found enough reason to rejoice together with the church today? Thank you and God bless you.